Welcome back for another study in God's Word. We're in uh, Romans chapter 13, but before I get to chapter 13, I'd like to review just a couple of things in chapter 12. In chapter 12, verse 1, it says we are to offer our bodies as living sacrifices, which is our spiritual worship. And then in verse 2, it says, don't conform, don't conform to the pattern of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind. Now, <clears throat> there are some things in the Bible, if our self is on the throne of our heart, there are some things in the Bible that are just impossible to follow. If self is on the throne and Jesus is on the, Christ, on the, the cross, but when we come to Jesus, self needs to be on the cross, need to be crucified with Christ, and Jesus needs to be on the throne of our heart. <clears throat> we sort of ran out of time and didn't spend much time with verse 9 and following in Romans 12. But it says, honor one another above yourselves. Well, if I'm living up here, I find that very difficult and even impossible to do. And then verse 14 says, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. And then verse 19 says, do not take revenge. Well, when I live up here, I find that just impossible to do because revenge is really sweet. But need to have Christ on the throne of our heart. And when we have that, then we are able to obey the Lord. As Paul says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now we come to chapter 13, and there's some things in chapter 13 that most Americans do not like at all because we're we're raised uh, as American citizens. We're raised valuing our freedom and independence. We, uh, you know, we don't like the idea of submitting to anybody. Patrick Henry said, give me liberty or give me death. And so we have that background, but then we come to chapter 13. And uh, if we're up here, we're going to find chapter 13 impossible to, to follow. Well, let's look at verses 1 through 2. <clears throat> on chapter 13. It says, Everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. So here it says that we are to submit ourselves to the governing authorities, and then the Holy Spirit twice in a row says, there's no authority except what God's established, and then it turns it around and says, the authorities that exist have been established by God. Now, we would like it to say, submit yourself to good governing authorities, but it doesn't say that. It says, submit yourselves to the governing authorities. And we look at the governing authorities that existed in the first century, and they weren't that hot. Back uh, over 30 years before this was written, King Herod had all the baby boys of Bethlehem murdered. And then later on, the Sanhedrin, the ruling group of the Jews, they had Jesus condemned, and then Pilate condemned Jesus. And then the Sanhedrin stoned Stephen. And then later on, another King Herod had the apostle James executed. And so, and then we think about the Roman em emperor at this time. That was Nero, a very, very cruel individual. So it doesn't say submit yourself to a government if you like the government. That's not what it says. And this isn't the only place in the New Testament where the Holy Spirit has said this. In 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 13, it says, Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every authority instituted among men whether to the king as the supreme authority or to the governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. And then verse 17 says, show proper respect to everyone, love the brotherhood of believers, fear God, honor the king. And here later on in chapter 13 of Romans, it talks about respecting the political leaders. Well, we've been trained in this country not to respect our political leaders. <clears throat> Back when Franklin Roosevelt was president, he was elected four times and died at the end of world, toward the end of World War II. He was a crippled man. He could not walk without heavy leg braces and crutches, but you never saw that on the news. He spent much of his time in a wheelchair, but you never saw that on the news. They respected him, or at least they respected the office, 
and you never saw him in that situation. But then fast forward a few years to when President Ford tripped coming down the stairs off of an airplane, and that was on all the news. And so we've been trained and we've been accustomed not to, uh, not to respect our political leaders. <clears throat> Daniel chapter 4 adds some more information about this, about the rulers that uh, we are to submit to. Daniel 4 and verse 17, we, this takes place during the kingship of King Nebuchadnezzar. And King Nebuchadnezzar was a very proud individual and God humbled him. And it says in Daniel 4, 17, the most high is sovereign over the kingdoms of men and gives them to anyone he wishes and sets over them the lowest of men. And so we read that God is sovereign over the kingdoms of men. And that's the whole issue. God is sovereign, and we can question God's sovereignty, but that's kind of like the uh, clay questioning what the potter does. We can question why it's that way, but God is sovereign, and I'm not sure there's a whole lot of profit in questioning God's sovereignty. But notice it says God is sovereign over the kingdoms, and he sets over them the lowest of men. Now, if we look back in recorded history over the past, say, 4,000 years, we find that that's, that's the case. We find that most powers, most rulers have not been very good rulers. If we take a look at the kings of Israel, starting off with Samuel and moving through uh, kings and then on into Chronicles, the first king was Saul, and Saul turned out to be not a good king at all. I mean, he had the whole... Um, city of Nob massacred men, women, and children. And then the next king was David, and David was a good king, although he was human and did, made some mistakes. Next king was King Solomon, and King Solomon started off well, but he turned out to be a very selfish individual. He taxed his people into the poorhouse. He did not obey God, and late in his life, he turned out to be an idolater. And then after Solomon, the kingdom was split into the northern ten tribes of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. And in the northern ten tribes of Israel, there was not one single good king there. And prophets like Elijah and Elisha were sent to turn them back to God, but every single one of their kings was bad. And when we look at the kings in, uh, in the southern kingdom of Judah, most of them were bad. They did have some good ones, but most of them were bad. And so most governments, most kings, most leaders have not been good. And uh, why is this? Well, I don't know, but let's remember, we live in a fallen world, and let's remember also this world is not our home. And one other thing that I might notice is the church had its fastest growth during the time of bad leaders. In the first century and second century, where there were bad leaders and the church was persecuted, the church had tremendous growth. There's a comprehensive history, I mean, you stack the books up, they're about this wide, by Will Durant. And the one he wrote on this time is called Caesar versus Christ. And at the end of his book, he says Christ won because eventually the Roman government accepted Christianity as their official religion. And you look today in China, China has a communist government. They have a government that persecutes Christians, but that doesn't hold the church down. Uh, the, the church is growing mightily in China today. So God is sovereign, and a lot of times political leaders are not good, but that doesn't stop the kingdom of God from for growing. And another verse along this line is Colossians 1, verse 16, where it talks about Jesus and what Jesus has done and created, and says he's created all things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, where the thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things were created by him and for him. Now we take a look at our situation in this country and we live under the United States Constitution. The Constitution is the supreme law of the land. I'll get back over here. And under the Constitution, we have the President and Congress and the Supreme Court, and then there's state governments and there's county governments and there's city governments, but the United States Constitution <clears throat> controls all the rest of these. If the President or Congress or a state or county or city does something that conflicts with the U.S. Constitution, 
ideally the Supreme Court steps in and declares it unconstitutional and so what they have done that goes against the Constitution is, is, is null and void. Well, if you remember, in Romans chapter 10 and verse 9, it says, If you shall confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. <clears throat> and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Well, we have dual citizenship. We're citizens of this country, but we're citizens of heaven, of, of the kingdom of heaven, and Jesus is our Lord. And just as the Constitution is supreme over anything the President or Congress or anybody else does, Jesus is Lord over everything. And uh, <clears throat> we, in, we have this principle that when a law of man conflicts with what Jesus wants us to do, and of course we have his word. When something down here conflicts with the word of God, we obey the word of God. In Acts chapter 5 and verse 29, we find Peter and John before the Sanhedrin. This was the ruling body of, of the Jews. And Peter and John were strictly commanded not to teach in the name of Jesus anymore. And they said, we must obey God rather than men. And so this is the biblical principle. We're to submit to our government when we can. But if what our government tells us conflicts with what the word of God tells us, Jesus is our supreme Lord. And Jesus himself emphasized this in Matthew 22, 21 where he was asked if they should pay taxes to the Roman government. Jesus says, give to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. So we submit to our physical government when we can, but God is on top and we obey God rather than man. Philippians 3 and verse 20 says, our citizenship is in heaven. And sometimes governments persecute people and in this country we haven't faced a whole lot of persecutions Laker, lately bakers and photographers have because they will refuse to participate in a gay wedding and so they're hauled into court and they're fined and put out of business and so on and uh, but when we are persecuted there's a blessing Matthew 5 and 10 Jesus says blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, what value is the kingdom of heaven? Well, Jesus told parables about that. He said, the kingdom of heaven is like a pearl of great price. And a person found that pearl, and they sold everything they had, and they got the pearl. Or the kingdom of heaven is like treasure in a field, and a man found the treasure, sold everything he had, bought the field, and had the treasure. So, what's the kingdom of heaven worth? The kingdom of heaven is worth every single thing that we have. And when we're persecuted for righteousness sake, we have the kingdom of heaven. Now, more and more it seems like that atheists are becoming, getting involved in politics, they're becoming judges and so on. Uh, recently there was a candidate for president who's, who has backed out and they're not running anymore. But he made the statement that if churches don't accept gay marriage, that they should lose their tax exemption. In other words, he's saying, if a church does not change their doctrine and, and rejects God's biblical definition of marriage, unless they do that, the federal government sh should come down hard on them. Atheists have gotten very aggressive. There's billboards, of, you know, that there is no God and so on. They uh, want to take the Ten Commandments down. They want to stop public prayer everywhere. And for the life of me, I don't understand how that hurts them. But they really have nothing to offer. In this church and in other churches, we have what's called disaster relief. When there's a disaster in the country, a flood, a tornado, a hurricane, so on, a disaster relief group of Christians goes and helps out. I've never heard of a disaster relief of atheists. I've never heard them getting together to help out. 
The Salvation Army, a Christian group, does much good. So does Samaritan's Purse. And here in this city, we have the Christian Outreach Center that helps feed and clothe the needy. I've never heard of any uh, uh, atheist group doing anything like that. Now, if we ever have the rapture and God calls all of his people out of this earth, the atheists will have what they want. They'll have a godless society and it will be hell on earth. While we're on the subject of atheists, now I'm getting off the subject just a little bit, but I think this is such a great story, I'd like to tell it. It comes from Dr. Ironside's book. Dr. Ironside was a preacher, lived a hundred years ago, amazing man. He wrote over 60 books, but in this particular case, he's living in San Francisco, and he has been a member of the Salvation Army, but he left that and branched out to evangelistic work. And on this particular day, he's walking down the street in, Sa in San Francisco, and he hears, hears a band playing, and he goes up, and it's the Salvation Army band. And there's about 60 members of the Salvation Army, and surrounding them are about is a group of about three or 400. And the Salvation Army captain recognizes Dr. Ironside and asked him to speak to the group. And he was always ready to give a gospel message whenever, wherever he could. So he gave a gospel message. He said that as he finished, he noticed a well-dressed man in the crowd take out a card, write something on it, and went up and handed it to Dr. Ironside. And here's what it read. It says, Sir, I challenge you to a debate with me, to debate with me the question of agnosticism versus Christianity in the Academy of Science Hall next Sunday afternoon at four o'clock. I will pay all expenses. Now you may be wondering what's the difference between an atheist and a ag person that believes in agnosticism. Well, there's not much. An atheist says there is no God. An agnostic says, well, there might be a God, but we don't know and there's no way to prove it. And they both reject the Bible and they both reject Jesus Christ. So there's not a whole lot of difference between them. Well, Dr. Ironside read the card out loud to the crowd, and then he said, I will be glad to agree to this debate on the following conditions, namely, that in order to prove, and he doesn't give the man's name, so I'm gonna call him Mr. Agnostic. In order to prove that Mr. Agnostic has something worth fighting for and worth debating about, he will promise to bring with him to the hall next Sunday two people whose qualifications I will give in a moment as proof that agnosticism is of real value in changing human lives and building true character. First, he must promise to bring with him one man who was for years what we commonly call a down and outer. I'm not particular as to the exact nature of the sins that had wrecked his life and made him an outcast from society, whether drunkard or criminal of some kind or a victim of any sensual appetite, but a man who for years was under the power of evil habits from which he could not deliver himself, but who on some occasion entered one of Mr. Agnosticism's meetings, heard his glorification of agnosticism and his denunciations of the Bible and Christianity, and whose heart and mind as he listened to such an address were so deeply stirred that he went away from the meeting saying, henceforth I too am an agnostic. And as a result of accepting that particular philosophy, he found that new power had come into his life, the sins he once loved, now he hated, and righteousness and goodness were henceforth the ideals of his life. He is now an entirely new man, a credit to himself, and an asset to society, all because he is an agnostic. Secondly, I would like Mr. Agnostic to promise to bring with him one woman, and I think he may have more difficulty in fighting the woman than the man, who was once a poor, wrecked, characterless outcast, a slave of evil passions, and a victim of man's corrupt living. But this woman entered a hall where Mr. Agnostic was loudly proclaiming his agnosticism and ridiculing the message of the Holy Scripture. And as she listened, hope was born in her heart. And she said, this is just what I need to deliver me from the slavery of sin. She followed the teaching. She became an intelligent agnostic or infidel. And as a result, her whole being revolted against the degradation of her life and she fled from the den of iniquity where she had been held captive so long, and today rehabilitated, she has won her way back to an honored position in society and is living a clean, virtuous, happy life, all because she is an agnostic.
And Dr. Ironside then says, if you'll bring those two people, he says, I'll bring a hundred. And he turned to the captain of the Salvation Army and he says, do you have any here? And the captain says, sure, we can, we can, we can give you 40 out of this group alone. And at that, the uh, Mr. Agnostic threw up his hand and turned around. He knew he was defeated because his, uh, his doctor and his philosophy did not change lives. So anyway, uh, atheists are very aggressive. They get in political power and uh, it's a shame. Recently, a politician in New York City, when the coronavirus situation seemed to be diminishing, he made the statement that it didn't have anything to do with prayer. Now, if he had made that statement maybe 10 years ago, I think it would have caused a lot of ripples, but uh, now people just pretty much ignored that. That's what's happening to our, to our, uh, to our society. But, uh, and I might just, might just say this, the most important thing a president can do is to appoint judges to the Supreme Court and other federal courts. The president is around for four years or eight years, but the federal judges he appoints are around for the rest of their life. And if we get atheistic judges, even though the Supreme, even though the Constitution gives us freedom of religion, they can they can redefine that and take that away from us. So when you vote for president, you might consider what kind of judges the president would appoint. Well, back to our obeying the government. We obey the government when we can, but there's sometimes we can't. In Daniel chapter three, we read about three Jewish boys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And King Nebuchadnezzar told them to bow down and worship an idol. And they told him, quote, we want you to know, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. And Johnny Cash sang a song that's not real well known, but it's called The Fourth Man in the Fire. And in that song, he says, they, they wouldn't bend, they wouldn't bow, they wouldn't burn. They were most uncooperative. And uh, then in Daniel chapter six, a law was passed that Daniel could not pray to anybody but the king. And of course, Daniel disobeyed that, he prayed to God. And in these cases, with the fiery furnace for the three boys and the dying, Daniel, lion's den for Daniel, God intervened and saved them, but that's the exception, not the rule. If you read in Hebrews 11, chapter, when we get to verse 35, it talks about all the people who were persecuted for the Lord's sake and how they were tortured and how they died and so on. And in the first century, Stephen was stoned to death and the apostle James was executed and there were persecutions. Apostle Paul was persecuted and according to tradition, he was eventually executed. And according to tradition, all the apostles except for John were um, were executed. And today we have the coronavirus situation and we have government telling us that we shouldn't meet uh, for health and safety reasons. And so we want to co cooperate with the government because of that, because of health and safety. But some people think that the government is overstepping their bounds and it's not necessarily health and safety anymore, but it's telling churches what they can do and what they can't do. Well, 1 Timothy 2 and 2, we're told to pray for kings and those in authority. And we also need, especially at this time, to pray for our pastors, that our pastors would, would be led by the Holy Spirit and they would make decisions on this that are the right, that are the right decisions. Let's uh, read verse three then. Verse three says for, Let's see, I wanna read verse two. Consequently, he who rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted. For those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. So it tells us here that we should not rebel against the government. And King David understood this. If you remember, Saul was chasing David all over the country, trying to kill him. And several times David had the opportunity to kill King Saul, but David wouldn't do that. David said, I will not kill, I will not harm God's anointed. God had appointed Saul and God and David felt that he would wait and let God in his own good time remove Saul. 
And eventually that happened. The Philistines removed Saul, and then David could become king. Now, David had, took, had, had killed King Saul. I don't think the tribe of Benjamin would have ever unified behind David. But David was patient and let God take care of it. Well, then let's read verses 3 through. It says, For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong, do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right, and he will commend you. Now, most of the time, that's the case. Most of the time, if we obey the government, then they will, they will leave us alone. It says, for he is God's servant to do you good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword for nothing. He is God's servant, an agent of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Now, we find that government one of their jobs is to punish the wrongdoer, promise, punish the, the lawbreakers. There's a controversy now or arguments and discussions over capital punishment. Should there be capital punishment or should there not be? Well, back under the law of Moses, God had no prom problem with capital punishment. It was ordered under the law of Moses. And you think about God's servant the uh, government, and by the way, God has saved servants and lost servants just because the government is his servant doesn't mean they're saved. But the government bears the sword. They're an agent of wrath. They're to punish. Now, what is a sword used for? If a soldier goes to war, he's going to use the sword to kill somebody. He's not going to use the sword to give them a suspended sentence or, or wound them in the arm or something. So our government bears the sword. They're an agent of wrath and they bring punishment on the, on the lawbreakers. And if a government doesn't do that, then that harms society. And uh, then it goes on and says, uh, therefore it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also because of conscience. This is why, also why you pay taxes for the authorities or God's servant who give their full time to governing. Give everyone what you owe him. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. Now, when this was written, Nero was the emperor. He was one of the most despicable, immoral human monsters that ever lived. But under him and under the Roman government, they had what was known as the Peace of Rome. And that allowed missionaries to go all the way around the Mediterranean Sea to preach the gospel. And even if we have a bad government, a bad government is better than no government. If we have no government, that would be the, the law of the jungle. And um, nobody and nothing would be safe. Now then, the next two parts of this, and I'm running out of time, the next part talks about love. And in Matthew 22 and verse 37, Jesus said that the two great commandments were to love God and love your neighbor. And in John 13, 34, Jesus gave a new command. He says, by this will all men know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And James 2 and 8 talks about love as the royal law. And I hope that as churches begin to open and, and uh, we have social distancing and so on, I hope that that uh, the members will love each other and will have patience and, and have patience with the uh, pastors and so on. And then the, uh, the last part, verse 11 through the end of chapter 13, talks about the coming of the Lord and about how his coming is, sooner to, is closer today than it was yesterday. So then quick review, as members of the as citizens of the U.S. were under the U.S. Constitution and the laws and so on of the country, but Jesus is our Lord and he's our highest authority. And when the government tells us to do something that conflicts with his word, our allegiance is to Jesus because he is our Lord.